Ahoy there fellow pirates, and I welcome you to this new series, which will cover the Sea of Thieves lore in a way that new players can hopefully understand. Now any information I cover in these videos are things that you can find out for yourself. There are only really a few sources of information about the game's lore, those being the game itself, which is full of dialogue and journals for you to piece together to build a cohesive story, and the two books, Athena's Fortune, which follows the Pirate Lord as he becomes the first pirate to enter the Sea of Thieves in the past, and has a parallel story following Lorena as she seeks her own adventures on the Sea of Thieves. The other book currently out is Tales from the Sea of Thieves, which features vague first-hand accounts from Flameheart Jr. and others. Additionally, there are a few comics, most of which are free to read. The Sea of Thieves art book is also beneficial, but not very useful for understanding the game's lore. With an ever-continuing story in the forms of adventures and mysteries, some newer players may feel overwhelmed by all of this, and might want some explainers, or maybe you've been playing a while and want a refresher. Well, now my average view duration has been eviscerated by the people who want to discover the game's secrets for themselves, let's get started by covering the Maiden Voyage. As most of you will know, the Maiden Voyage is the game's tutorial, which you'll have to play through when you first boot the game up. Despite its significance, it wasn't actually added until 2019, over a year after release. As soon as you awaken on this strange island, you're introduced to our first character, and that's you. But who is you? Well, you is whoever you make you out to be, so we'll add you to our list of characters, which will slowly expand throughout the series. And here's our second character, the Pirate Lord, whose real name is Ramsey Singh. Uh, don't really know why they gave him a Sikh name, given that he's uh, probably not Sikh. But there we are. There's a lot to talk about this character, which I'll be covering later, but feel free to bombard me with information about him in the comments anyway. All you need to know for now is that he commissioned and captained the first ship to enter the Sea of Thieves, the Magpie's Wing. So why did he need to get a ship specifically built for the journey into the Sea of Thieves? The answer is the Devil's Shroud, which I think is most clearly visible in this maiden voyage in all of its glory. It's a fog surrounding the whole Sea of Thieves that eats away at any non-organic matter, so acts as an impassable barrier to most ships wanting to enter. No one knew what was on the other side until Ramsey passed through the fog aboard the Magpie's Wing, arriving on the other side at Thieves Haven, same as we do, implying that we enter through the same path as Ramsey did all those years ago. The Magpie's Wing was only able to make its way through the Shroud due to it being small and nimble. It wasn't even made out of anything fancy, like really strong wood or carbon fibre or anything like that. If I was trying to make my way through the Shroud, I'd probably consider the fact that the Shroud doesn't destroy organic matter and build my ship out of meat or something. Are, are meat boats possible? I, I think I'm getting off topic here. The first thing the Pirate Lord tells us to do when we wake up is to eat a banana, the backstory being that the banana grew on a tree. The PL goes on to explain that when he discovered this island, he was just a bold explorer like you, and you find proof of this throughout the island, which we'll take a look at later. He explains further that few pirates make it to the Sea of Thieves, and that we have one last crossing to make, but we'll first need tools and equipment. You take a sword lodged on a skeleton's chest, and the skeleton wakes up and needs killing. Fun fact about this skeleton is that it takes three hits to kill, whether you sword lunge it or just hit it normally. That's, that's a bit weird. The Sea of Thieves has magical properties, where a banana can heal your wounds, and a skeleton can become reanimated after death. However, these properties seem to have made it to this island. In the book, Athena's Fortune, the Shroud is described as ebbing and flowing like a living being. So it seems likely to me that this island we've woken up on was once within the Shroud, and has kept some of its magical properties. There's also the question of what is this skeleton doing here tied to a tree with a sword at its chest? We may never know, but it's unlikely that this was the Pirate Lord's sword. The guy probably has some swankier cosmetics than that, eh? The Pirate Lord then explains that there's more to the Sea of Thieves than watching streamers do epic crew wipe Athena million strung hold keg mega steals. It's also about adventure and exploration. So he pulls a shovel out of his back pocket and hands it to you, showing that even after death, some pirates can still interact physically with the real world. You go on to dig up the old sailor's chest, full of the Pirate Lord's old belongings, probably from before he ever entered the Sea of Thieves. This chest design can only be found in one other place, but that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves. That design on top of the chest is the symbol of the Magpie's Fortune, the ship that now makes up the wreck on the island. It's like most shipwrecks on the Sea of Thieves, wherein it makes you go, how, uh, how do you even crash that badly? Although many players probably leave the island immediately, it's a lot of fun to explore before you leave, and I honestly think that this is the most beautiful island in the game. 
This island is called Old Sailor's Isle. Let's unlock its secrets. There are 10 journals throughout the island, mostly giving tutorial tips with a hint of lore behind them. I'll be going through them in no particular order. The first journal we can find is at the smaller shipwreck to the northwest of the island. I'm gonna do my best pirate lord voice now. A new landmark. This stricken ship certainly wasn't here during my last visit. There's no sign of her crew, so perhaps they fell overboard and met their end. Things are very different on the Sea of Thieves, thanks in no small part to my own adventures, I must confess. We have an arrangement with the merfolk who live deep under the waves. Should any pirate become lost at sea, stranded, they'll help them back to their ship. If you should find yourself flung overboard, traveller, look for the merfolk's beacon before the sharks get your scent. You'll be glad you did. If you're watching this video, you're likely aware of the merfolk who help you back to your ship if you fall off, and this journal implies that the Pirate Lord is responsible for this mechanic. This is confirmed in the Athena's Fortune Book, as Ramsay and his crewmate Mercia are able to make contact with the merfolk using a pair of earrings discovered in an underwater cave. They then help the merfolk by rescuing their merfolk brethren, who had been imprisoned by one Captain Douglas. Due to this interaction, the merfolk now help us back to our ships when lost at sea. Our next journal can be found in the cave behind the waterfall, next to a dead skeleton clutching a map to the Sea of Thieves. Not all my journeys to this island are happy ones. Today I stumbled onto this poor soul, map still in their hands. To think they were so close. No matter how swiftly we sail or how sharp our aim, it's only a matter of time before the reaper's hand clamps down upon our shoulder. I am fortunate to have a friend with wisdom enough to know this. Thanks to her, I live on beyond my years, at least in spirit. For younger pirates, another hope presents itself. When they perish, their souls are saved from drifting alone through the Sea of the Damned. If you should die on the Sea of Thieves and find yourself in the ferryman's company, know this, he deserves your respect, for he has made the greatest sacrifice of all. This journal is of course about death. The circumstances surrounding the death of the Pirate Lord are currently unknown, but he does have three daggers lodged in his back, so it seems like he was betrayed by someone. His spirit is able to live on after death thanks to the Reaper's Mark necklace given to him by Mercia, his longtime crewmate, the same one who wore the earrings that allowed her to commune with the merfolk. Given her importance in the story, we'll add her to our list of characters. She seems to be the one referenced in this journal, who had wisdom enough to know that it's only a matter of time before death catches up to you on the Sea of Thieves. This journal also makes reference to pirate souls now being rescued from the Sea of the Damned when they die, and sent back to the living world by the ferryman. You'll have met him piloting the Ferry of the Damned, chained to the helm for all eternity. This journal references him making the greatest sacrifice of all. I imagine piloting a galleon solo for all eternity to be a pretty big sacrifice, but the circumstances under which he made this sacrifice are currently unknown. All I do know is that this character deserves our thanks, even though he's fictional. Let's pop him in our list of characters. The third journal can be found next to the Wheel of the Magpie's Fortune, and appears to have been written soon after most pirates had started plundering the Sea of Thieves for all it's worth. The Sea of Thieves. That's what they're calling it nowadays. The genie is out of the bottle, and more pirates are finding their way there every day. Some are looking to hide from their enemies, from their pasts, from the Grand Maritime Union, while others have heard the call to adventure. It's only a matter of time before they reach this island too. Maybe they'll be dreaming of what the Sea of Thieves has to offer, just as I was. If that's the shape of things to come, I'd be a fool to complain. Instead, I'll stow a few supplies around the place for those who need them. Things work differently beyond the Shroud. Better, for the most part, but newcomers will have to think on their feet if they're to survive. This journal tells us that the Pirate Lord wasn't the one who named the Sea of Thieves, he was just the first to go there, and it was not named as such until other pirates started plundering it. Originally, Ramsay planned to be the only one with access to the Sea of Thieves given that he's a greedy capitalist, but one of his crew, Rathbone, spread the word of how to enter the Sea of Thieves to Stitcher Jim and his crew. We'll be coming back to Rathbone in future, but he's a pretty important character, as is Stitcher Jim, so say hello to the character list, lads. Ramsay did eventually come to care more about the glory of the pirate's life than about the gold, and admitted his wrongdoings. 
This journal also mentions that some may be looking to hide from the Grand Maritime Union, who are a massive trade corporation outside of the Sea of Thieves, sort of like a fictional version of the East India Trading Company. The GMU attempted to make its way into the Sea of Thieves on one known occasion, sending a whole fleet through the Shroud, and only one ship made it through. One of the survivors on the ship was junior trader Molly, who formed the Merchant Alliance and became chief trader. So, although many escaped the GMU, now people have to deal with the Merchant Alliance. The fourth journal can be found atop the mast of the Magpie's Fortune. Blast it all! The key to my ship's hold is missing. It must have slipped from my pocket at some point in my time here. Between this and that business with Rathbone, I'm developing a bad habit of losing the keys to my belongings. Perhaps it made its bid for freedom from my jacket when I climbed up for a drink of fresh spring water. It's another lost treasure now. This journal is mainly used to give the player a clue to where the key of the hold of the magpie's fortune can be found. If you didn't know, there's a trapdoor leading to hidden riches at the base of the wreck of the magpie's fortune, but it requires a key. This journal tells us it's in the spring water nearby. Even with this information, the key can be pretty hard to find, but here it is. I'll be unlocking the trapdoor later. For now, let's cover that business with Rathbone. When the Pirate Lord got tired of people murdering each other for loot on the Sea of Thieves, he decided to establish some order by hiding golden unbreakable chests, made from a metal which once made up the chains that held down the long-dead Kraken, Old Mother. These chests could only be opened using a set of keys forged by the Pirate Lord and his crew. Rathbone, however, secretly opposed this plan, and decided to make copies of these keys, which he distributed throughout his newfound faction, the Gold Hoarders. The Gold Hoarders now have you seeking out chests, as they are the only ones with the means to unlock them, and they'll give you a cut of their contents. The next journal lies at the front of the shipwreck, and reads, You've really done it this time, Ramsay. It's one thing to return to your favourite island, and quite another to wreck your ship at the heart of it. I was bound to get careless sooner or later. This place has been my little secret for so long now. I couldn't wait to get back there. To dream. I'm so close to the shroud. I feel like I could reach out and touch it. I'm not ready to sport a hook for a hand though. Not yet, anyway. What lies on the other side? Piles of glittering gems. Huge leviathans the size of galleons. Even better. Might there be a future for pirates like me? Next time, things will be different. I'll visit Magpie the Shipwright and buy a new vessel. Take my time, find a crew, we shall sail together." This journal was evidently written after Ramsay crashed the Magpie's fortune on Old Sailor's Isle, as he arrived there to ponder what might be hidden in the Shroud. He doesn't seem to be aware at this point that the Shroud doesn't eat away at organic matter, because he thinks putting his hand in the Shroud will destroy his hand. It also tells us that the Magpie's Fortune and the Magpie's Wing, that first ship to sail through the Shroud, were both built by the shipwright Magpie. Let's make a list of ships, and add these two ships to it. We're halfway through the journals now, so let's take a quick break from the lore and get meta. Unlike almost all the rest of the game, the Maiden Voyage is quite linear, so it has more potential for out-of-bound secrets. In my previous video, I used a pretty convoluted method for swimming around in the Sea of Thieves area of the map. However, thanks to this comment, I've derived a simpler method that allows you to sail around in this area. First thing you should know is that the first ship the Maiden Voyage gives you cannot take hull damage, and once you've raised its anchor to set sail, you'll be respawned back on board if you attempt to leave it. However, we can sink this ship by throwing many books of water on board. This must be done after the game gives you permission to set sail, or else it won't work. Once you've sunk your ship and a new one spawns, set sail. Stay on board until you're almost at the end of the tale. I decided to cannon off when the skeleton ship gets attacked by the Kraken to get a closer look at it. And fun fact, the skeleton ship has no skeletons or cannons, so it's just shooting at you with thin air. Normally the tale would end when we pass through this barrier that triggers the end of the tale, but we can avoid this by allowing our ship to sail through the barrier and out to the other side, and then drowning ourselves. We can then respawn back on the ship and sail around the Sea of Thieves. Out here you can find low poly islands, including Thieves Haven, what I think is supposed to be Booty Isle, Sharkbait Cove, and Plunder Outpost. One very bizarre thing I found was a floating beacon. I have no idea why this is here, and I can't be bothered to speculate. I tried to shoot up to it, but the game takes away all your equipment when you pass through the barrier, so I couldn't even have lit it if I wanted to. After three attempts to get up, I looked in the mirror and wondered what I was doing with my life. Is this it? Will I ever feel fulfilled when my goes to watch on as the world goes to shit? 
The Red Sea doesn't exist on the Maiden Voyage, not as it does in the main game anyway. I sailed off the map to the north and was respawned as soon as I crossed the map's outermost barrier. I respawned without a ship and tried drowning myself to see if my ship had spawned elsewhere, but it hadn't. I tried escaping with the rowboat but there was an invisible barrier in the way, so I was trapped forever. Were it not for the leave game option, I could still be stranded on there to this day. Another cool thing I found out of Bounds is that it's pretty wicked sailing through the shroud having to weave in and out of rocks in the mist. Shipwrecks with no coded collisions scattered about the place. Finally, I thought it would be funny if I ended the voyage with me leaving the Sea of Thieves instead of entering it. So, uh, <laughs> who's that lol? Our next journal is found on a ledge at the base of this ladder. Once long ago I was standing atop these cliffs staring out to sea, quite lost in my own thoughts. Suddenly there was an almighty crashing sound. It was a kraken, and one of the largest I'd seen in quite some years. I was so startled I couldn't help but take a leap backwards in surprise. Once I'd picked myself up, battered and bloody, I decided to install this ladder in case any future visitors took a tumble in the same way. Nowadays, thanks to that fool Merrick, Krakens aren't the only sea monsters to watch for. Megalodons are once more roaming freely beneath the waves. They can prove quite the challenge even for experienced pirates. Why, I once battled a monstrous pale-skinned beast and... Well, I'll save that tale for another time. I'll reenact the event described in this journal best I can. Yeah, I know. Perfect. I'm not sure why a Kraken was outside the Sea of Thieves, but as I said earlier, the Shroud is quite turbulent in the storyline, despite being static in the main game. And it's possible that this event took place whilst Old Sailor's Isle was swallowed up by the Shroud. This journal also makes reference to Merrick, quite a pivotal character and now leader of the Hunter's Call, and how he played an accidentally enchanted shanty with his crew, which summoned the Megalodon for the first time, an event which left him with no legs, no crew, and no ship. So it's a bit mean for Ramsey to call the man a fool. The guy literally went through one of the most traumatic experiences imaginable because he accidentally played a song so shit it awoke an ancient sea terror. The final line of the journal makes reference to a pale beast, most likely meaning the Shrouded Ghost. All I'll say on the Shrouded Ghost for now, and I know most of you already know this, but if you see a completely white, possibly glowing light pink megalodon, do not hesitate to drop anchor and kill it. It's the rarest event in the game, and some who have thousands of hours in the game are yet to encounter it. Oh, and invite your friend to the game if you find it whilst sailing solo. Actually, your friend can go fuck themselves. Invite me instead. Of all the unsolved mysteries that haunt my dreams, none are more tantalizing than the long lost people known to pirates as the Ancients. Their legacy can be felt all across the Sea of Thieves, from ruins that lurk deep under waters to cliff-top paintings that shame my humbler efforts. They clearly had a great wealth of knowledge and had mastered many curses and other arcane powers. And yet, something drove them to leave. Maybe some great war or calamity struck their civilization. Perhaps it was simply time for them to move on. The truth, as it always has, eludes us all. This journal is about the mysterious ancient people who inhabited the Sea of Thieves long before as pirates, and there's a lot to talk about them, so I'll be saving that discussion for a future video where they're more relevant. All you really need to know for now is that they're responsible for rock paintings across the seas, except the one on the Maiden Voyage Island, which I guess the Pirate Lord painted and was kind of referenced in this journal. The ancients are also responsible for any magical artifacts which you come across, such as the Shroud Breaker or the Veil of the Ancients, or those earrings which allowed Mercia to commune with the Merfolk. Our next journal is through a door opened by the pull of a lever and is found next to a campfire. Even with all the wonders I've experienced, it's the simple things in life remain the most enjoyable. Tonight, that's a hot meal roasted over a roaring fire. Fresh fruits are well and good, but if you take time to properly prepare a meal, you'll feel all the better for it. The trick is to keep an eye on the dish and serve it up when it's perfectly cooked. No amount of grog can wash away the taste of burned food. 
With care and a bit of practice, even a humble splash tail can keep a pirate in good health with a full belly. At least they're good for something. There's not much to this journal besides explaining that if you cook something to perfection, it's at its tastiest. As for splash tails, it's generally better to sell fish, but you're probably okay to eat a splash tail. Our next journal is a basic tutorial about each type of ship in the game. We've all seen what happens when huge armadas try to make it through the Devil's Shroud, and it's not pretty. Screaming sailors and splintered ships. I learned long ago that smaller crews have a better chance of making it along the twisting routes that provide safe passage to the Sea of Thieves. A lone traveller is best served by a sloop. They're small and nimble, though their size comes at the expense of firepower. Larger crews must sail a brigantine, or even the mighty Galleon, a commanding sight with her eight cannons and three great sails. Then of course we have the humble rowboat. These tiny craft can be carried by the other larger ships, and are perfect for retaining the element of surprise. I assume that this journal's reference to armadas travelling through the Shroud could be about the Grand Maritime Union's attempt to do so that I mentioned earlier, but it also seems to imply that there have been much more than one attempt at bringing a large number of ships through the Shroud at once. Our final journal is in the hold of the Magpie's Fortune, which you can unlock by using the key we found earlier. Quick fun fact about this key is that it's the only item on this voyage that can be placed inside the old sailor's chest we found at the start. Anyway, within the hold of the Magpie's Fortune, you'll find 25,000 goals, which isn't there for me since I already found it all, as well as a map showing us the Sea of Thieves' real-world location. Finally, you'll find the last journal down here. If you're reading this, you've broken my strongbox, which makes you a worthy pirate indeed. Worthy enough to hear my plan. Transforming this old stomping ground of mine into a safe haven for travellers has sparked something deep within my soul. It is the flame of an idea. A great tavern, far more magnificent than the usual pubs and alehouses, known only to truly legendary pirates. A den that sold only the finest plunder, where hardened adventurers and cunning sea dogs could meet to swap stories of gold and glory. If you make it to the Sea of Thieves, and should your heart desire a real challenge, heed my words. Seek Athena's fortune. I shall be waiting. Athena's fortune is not a treasure, it's the name of the tavern referenced to in this journal, and can only be accessed by pirate legends and their crews in the main game. The pirate lord didn't really achieve his goals though, because it says in this journal that it'll sell the finest plunder, not ugly repulsive plunder. Anyway, that was the last journal, so let's move on. Quick fun fact, there's a rowboat in this cave, and when you start rowing it, a little tune of row 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 your boat starts playing, so that's wholesome. Upon returning to the Pirate Lord, he parts the Shroud and tells you to sail through it. How does he have the power to part the Shroud? Good question, there's no answer unfortunately, but maybe the beacons in the Shroud have some kind of arcane power that parts the Shroud. Or it's also possible that the beacons are simply lighting a permanent route through that miserable mist. The Pirate Lord then sends you to repair your ship, which I would speculate may have been damaged in a storm since it's got water below deck, but no sign of hull damage and a destroyed mast, which could have been destroyed by a storm. Although this doesn't really happen in the main game. Maybe you had a keg in your crow's nest or something. It doesn't really matter. So, you journey through the shroud, encountering a megalodon, a skeleton ship, and a kraken. Basically every emergent threat you can find on the waves. You then arrive on the other side of the shroud, south of Thieves Haven, and sail into the sunset. And so ends the most beautiful introduction to any game that there is, as far as I'm concerned. We'll be back soon to cover the Shroud Breaker Tall Tale. I imagine that this will likely be the longest video in the series, given that it's an introduction and there was a hell of a lot to unpack. I'll try not to explain the same thing more than once in this series unless absolutely necessary, but until then, safe voyages everyone.